Okay, hello everyone. I'm going to talk about a quite interesting and relevant problem from semiconductor production, namely photolithography. This involves a certain uh, batching requirements. And as it turns out, if we uh, formalize this problem as job scheduling, it is quite difficult. And consequently, we present it as an open challenge. So this work has been uh, the result of a collaboration between Bosch, a German manufacturing company, and Theo Wien. So let's start with some um, motivation. So photolithography is a quite important subtask in semiconductor production. So this is the part where patterns are transferred using uh, radicals, which are photomasks, to wafers. So this is an illustration here. You can see a photomask. And then UV light passes through and is used to write the pattern on the on the wafer. So uh, typically in those work centers, there are a lot of jobs that need to be processed, and they use quite expensive equipment. And often uh, this poses the bottleneck in the production process. Um, we want to model this problem as job scheduling on unrelated parallel machines. So there are different uh, ways to um, address such a problem. However, ideally we want to use exact solvers that use a declarative model. So on the one hand, exact solvers um, can, can show up the melody of, the, of, a, of a solution. But to be fair, this is not uh, really relevant in, in practice when instances are large. More important is the declarative model, so which is a um, human readable representation of the requirements. Such models tend to be compact and easy to maintain when requirements change, and this keeps maintenance costs low. But maybe even more important is that uh, valuable knowledge about the application is explicitly represented and not hidden in the implementation. So let's talk about the actual photolithography problem and why it is difficult. So the, um, as I said, we want to model this as a job scheduling problem on unrelated parallel machines. And our goal is to minimize the make span. So here we have, you can see an illustration of a, of a, of a schedule. So that, that we have the jobs assigned to machines. And what we want to minimize, this is the, this is the make span, which is the completion time of the, of the last job of any machines. And we want to move this to the left as far as possible, which in the end will improve throughput. So every job is processed by one machine capable of doing so. So we have to deal with machine capabilities. Um, the job durations are machine dependent. So some of the machines are faster, some of the machines are slower. This has to be taken into account. And also every job comes with a, with a release date. So and, and the jobs cannot start before the release date. For example, this guy, but this guy, this is the release date. And, and it has to st uh, start afterwards. Therefore, we have this we have this gap here. But this is not all. Uh, additionally, we have to consider setup times for jobs. So before a job can start, a certain uh, setup has to be performed. And I've illustrated this um, here for this job in the middle. So the actual processing time of the job consists of the duration plus the setup. And the setup um, depends on the predecessor. Sometimes there's no setup needed. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it is shorter. But what this means is that the order of the jobs of the machines matters. And on top of the machine assignment problem, we have to solve a sequencing problem. And this makes the problem already uh, more difficult, but um, still doable. Now the, the aspect that makes it really hard and that is specific to photolithography is that we have to deal with uh, the photomasks, the radicals. So as I said, every job needs, to, needs a specific radical to be uh, processed. So this means uh, radicals represent additional auxiliary resource constraints um, and jobs that require the same radical cannot be processed at the same time. Now, um, radicals are quite fragile and expensive pieces of equipment and they cannot be transported freely from one machine to another. Um, we actually use pots of a fixed size to use uh, to, to safely transport them from uh, from, from to the machines. And for transportations, uh, for transportation, we use robots that, uh, 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 that, that are used for equipping and transporting entire pots with the right radicals from the radical stockers in time. 
This means in the end, jobs need to be carefully patched into groups or machines uh, that only require radicals from a single pot. So I've illustrated this for this for the schedule here. So we, with different background colors, I highlighted different patches on the first machine. We have two patches. The first one requires radical one and two. The second one requires radical three and, and two. And you can see here that this patch here in, with green background color and this one here in blue, uh, they cannot overlap because they share the same radical R3. So once this patch completes, the transport robot, which moves rather slowly, has to take the pot, bring it back to the stocker, uh, re-equip it, and transport it uh, to this machine. And in the end, this has to be scheduled uh, in a careful way. And uh, this is what turns this problem, which, which makes this problem quite, uh, quite, quite difficult. Um, we don't come completely empty-handed, we also present um, a mini-sync model for uh, schedule optimization. So as you might recall, mini-sync is a high-level solver-independent modeling language that is often used for optimization problems. And in uh, mini-sync, uh, mini-sync can be used by a wide range of solvers MIP and CP solvers after uh, compiling the mini-sync model into, into flat sync. So traditionally, uh, mini-sync is not considered a knowledge representation reasoning language. Uh, for that, usually more logic-based uh, formalisms uh, are used. Nevertheless, it accomplishes that uh, requirements can be uh, represented in a human readable form quite concisely and, declar in a, and, in, and declaratively um, as illustrated as illustrated here. So here we have a mini sync constraint that uh, assigned machines has to be capable and we can write a constraint that expresses that for all jobs, the machine assignment of these jobs has, has to be taken from a, from a capable machine. So how does this model perform? Well, we also uh, published 500 randomly generated benchmark instances. So they're randomly generated. Nevertheless, they are designed to, in a certain sense, reflect the structure of the problems at the, at the factory. The number of machines ranges from three to 20, and the number of jobs ranges from five to 200. So those uh, benchmark set con uh, contains also instances of realistic size. We also consider instances with both high and low machine dedication. Uh, high machine dedication means that we have jobs that can only processed by a few number of machines, by low number of machines. And this is, this is also a realistic assumption. As a time limit, uh, we are using 15 minutes. Uh, this is rather short, but this is uh, required since we have to reschedule quite, quite frequently uh, to take uh, certain events into consideration like machine failures or, or, or new jobs that have to be uh, added. Um, for solvers, we used Google OR tools, CP optimizer, and CPLEX. So we can see this here for, for, for quite a number of problems, we can show optimality of the solutions, but of course, those instances are uh, rather, rather small. Um, the highest number of, of best solution found um, uh, is, from, is from Google OR tools. And the most feasible solutions are found by CP optimizer. But still 55 uh, out of 500 instances is not, is not a lot. Uh, only about 10% of the instances can be, uh, can be solved. And this is of course not a, not, a, not a very good solution to this problem, or this is not uh, any, a solution to this problem um, um, at all. This is just a first baseline. So indeed, um, we present this, this problem as, as an open challenge for exact solvers. We think it's a, it is a very relevant problem. And a benchmark set like this can help to improve scheduling met methods. And of course, any improvement uh, can help to uh, make the production process better. So we also have a couple of ideas. How the, how the road ahead could, could look like. So what could be done to actually achieve better results? 
Uh, on the one hand, uh, we can improve the encodings. That is always an option. So instead of the mini sync model, which is a good starting point, because you can uh, you can you can immediately uh, benchmark different different uh, solvers. Uh, instead of that, we can try to come up with direct and more optimized encodings for the for the individual solvers. So it's not a little bit uh, not so clear. Probably this will not solve the problem uh, entirely. We could we could also consider to rephrase the problem as an online scheduling problem over a sliding time window, where we um, where we where we just schedule newly arriving jobs. Um, another direction would be to consider approximations of the problem. For example, we could only uh, schedule a subset of the of the jobs according to some selection strategy within a limited horizon to make the uh, procedure more greedy. Uh, or we could follow um, a two-phased approach where we separate the machine assignment problem and radical patching from the sequencing on the on the on the machines, and then we go back and forth to obtain an overall uh, schedule. And finally, uh, we could also consider meta heuristics. In particular, we could try to leverage the capabilities of declarative problem solving with, for example, large neighborhood search, where we use an exact solver and we start with a solution and then we uh, destroy parts of the solution and let the solver reconstruct it with the goal to uh, improve the overall uh, objective. Uh, so those are a couple of um, ideas. Um, if you have further ideas, we are happy to, to learn about them. So thank you for your attention.